over two years after uh, we introduced the original Green New Deal resolution, which has now inspired a great deal of uh, of uh, similar resolutions and Green New Deal resolutions adopted and introduced in municipalities and states across the country. And not only has have similar resolutions been introduced, but we also have seen um, in inspiration into other forms of Green New Deal legislation, like the Green New Deal for public housing, the Green New Deal for public schools, and beyond. But, you know, I think one thing that's uh, very important for us to discuss about is a very urgent matter, which is the infrastructure package that is right here before Congress, that is being negotiated uh, by both the House and the Senate. And while I certainly wish sometimes that, uh, that our legislation was informed primarily by the legislators that are here writing this legislation, by communities that are impacted by this legislation, it goes without saying that there's a great deal of dark money involved in the fight against, in the fight on climate change. And that dark money is intended for us to not act in this situation. We have lobbyists from companies like ExxonMobil bragging about their role in shaping our federal legislation, in curtailing our ambitions, and in fighting against uh, key provisions to draw down our carbon emissions. And whenever I see something like this, whenever I see how dark money and lobbyists act as a wedge and a cudgel between elected officials and public servants and the people that we are supposed to represent. Um, not only does it, not only do I think it's heartbreaking, but it is, uh, it is very much tragic. And you know, there's a, there's a key issue that we have here. Um, in, in acting on climate. And a big part of that issue is the fact, is something that we call a kind of a principal agent problem, where the people who are in charge of making decisions are simply not aligned and not incentivized to make the right ones because they are not feeling the impact of it. And I get concerned when we have conversations that the politics of the day get involved and intercede and they, and they complicate the policy for a generation. And it is so critically important because I can't help but imagine that so many of the people that are in charge of blocking action on climate will not see the world that they're leaving to generations to come. And we have a moral responsibility to leave this world better than we found it. This is not about theory anymore. This is not about challenging the science anymore. New York City, just yesterday, people woke up having a harder time breathing and having a harder time seeing on the horizon because of the smoke from the bootleg fires out in Oregon coming out to our city. Wildfires will come and impact all of us. Floods and waters will come to impact all of us, but they will not impact all of us equally. The most vulnerable communities will be left behind and we can stop it. It doesn't have to be this way. Not only can we stop it, and not only can we draw down our emissions, but we can create millions of jobs doing so. Millions of good union jobs. And we can create a civilian climate core. We can transition to renewable energy. We can build infrastructure that all people can enjoy that's not just attuned to the wealthy. We can restore our lands. We can live in harmony in, in, with an economy where we can care for one another instead of extracting off of each other. 
We can build this world, and this world is close. It is so close. It is so close, and that is why we see dark money mobilizing the way that it, that it is right now, because they know that we can win. And hopefully in this package, we will continue to win. But this fight does not stop now. It does not stop with this infrastructure package. It will not stop, frankly, throughout the course of our lives because we have a responsibility to leave this world to a better place to ourselves and to our children. So thank you very much, and um, I yield back.